Sounds good. Um, well, hello and welcome to today's webinar um, brought to you by Moms Clean Air Force and Earthworks. My name is Alex Merlino. I am a one of two New Mexico field organizers at Moms Clean Air Force. And we're a national community of more than one million moms and dads united against air pollution on behalf of our children's health. Here in New Mexico, we have over 11,000 members across the state who are mobilized to protect our children's health through direct actions, both online and on the ground. Moms Clean Air Force is really excited to partner with Earthworks today to share and discuss their groundbreaking research on the threats posed by the oil and gas industry air pollution in terms of risks to our children's health right here in New Mexico, and localities like those in New Mexico's San Juan Basin. As a member-driven organization, Moms Clean Air Force knows how important it is to bring proven science-based data to our membership in impacted states, but also to bring it to members of the media. So today we'll hear from three speakers who will each speak for about two or three minutes if you have questions as speakers are presenting, feel free to ask them in the Zoom chat. Identify yourself and who you're writing for. After the speakers have finished, if we have chat questions, we'll put the questions to the speakers in the orders they were received, and we'll provide the questioner the opportunity to follow up. Then we'll open the floor to all other questions. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, we'll hear from Alan Septoff. He is the Strategics Communication Director for Earthworks. And Alan will ground us in the significance of Earthworks research and the central findings as they relate to children in New Mexico. Alan will have approximately three minutes during which he will also visually demonstrate the online tools available. Next, we'll hear from Janine Yazi. Janine is the CEO of Sixth World Solutions, senior planner at Little Colorado Watershed Association, and mother of two. And then uh, we'll hear from Stacy Stevens, an environmental and social justice advocate and mother of two. Again, after our last speaker, we'll open the call up for questions. Um, while the while the speakers are presenting, feel free to ask questions in the Zoom chat. <clears throat> After all the speakers have finished, um, we'll do the chat questions first in the order they're received. Then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. We'll wrap this up by 1.15, giving us 45 minutes in all. Before we get started, I wanna mention that this event will be recorded. We will include the link in a press release that will be emailed to everyone on this call following the webinar. It will also include other important links, so be sure to, to look out for that email. So with that, I turn the floor over to Alan. Are we having a technical difficulty here? Yes, Alan, we're unable to hear you. Ah, okay. <laughs> Apologies. Um, let's try that again. Um, let's our, we also okay. lost, there you're, you're, it's back. Okay. Apologies for that. Um, my name is Alan Septoff. I am Strategic Communications Director with Earthworks and sometimes difficult slide wrangler. Um, Earthworks is a national nonprofit that focuses on protecting communities and the environment from the uh, negative impacts of resource extraction, uh, in this case, uh, oil and gas development. 
Um, and with uh, Frack Tracker Alliance, uh, we have created uh, a threat map. Uh, and the threat map is a national, state, and county inventory of active oil and gas production facilities uh, combined with an analysis of populations threatened by those facilities. And I'll give you a bit more detail about that. So what's in the map is uh, all active oil and gas wells, compressors, and processors related to uh, production or, and extraction of oil and gas um, from state and industry data. The, uh, the well data is straight from the state of New Mexico. Uh, the compressors and processors data uh, is a combination of state and industry data. Um, to be clear, this is just production. This is not refining. This is not waste disposal. It's just related to extraction. Uh, around each one of those wells, we have drawn on a map a half-mile health threat radius. And that half-mile health threat radius is drawn from peer-reviewed science of health impacts. Um, it is not, to be clear, uh, a, uh, a bright line. If you live outside the health threat radius, it doesn't mean that you are safe. Inside the health threat radius doesn't mean that you're doomed. What it means is that at a half mile is where peer-reviewed science most strongly correlates negative health impacts with proximity to oil and gas production facilities, and that correlation is stronger the closer one lives to a oil and gas production facility. Um, with that, we have taken Census Bureau data and Department of Education data uh, and identified people and schools that are reside within that half mile threat radius all over New Mexico and actually all over the nation. And so what's news? Well, what's news is school the school impacts. Uh, in the state of New Mexico, 32,000 children attend 99 schools and daycares within the half mile threat radius, and 138,000 total New Mexicans reside within that half mile uh, threat radius. Um, uh, and that is important now because uh, the Trump administration is in the midst of uh, Scott Pruitt's EPA is in the midst of uh, trying to eliminate safeguards that would reduce this kind of pollution. Um, if they succeed, uh, and they have lost several court cases but are now trying to uh, roll back this safeguard through the regulatory process, if they succeed, that makes the state of New Mexico's uh, ongoing discussion about implementing state safeguards similar to what Colorado has done and California is doing, it makes New Mexico state's action all the more important because um, between EPA rollbacks and actually uh, the BLM, they're trying to do the same thing with BLM safeguards, it makes New Mexico safeguards all the more important. So. There are other things in the map. Uh, there was actually an, a version of this map that was released last year um, with 2016 data that did not include the school data. Um, and so that information has been updated, uh, demographic breakdowns and ethnic breakdowns. Um, and we also have videos of the type of pollution we're discussing on the New Mexico State page. There's links to um, videos of New Mexico pollution and also with interviews of uh, New Mexicans impacted by this pollution. Also in the map but not updated from 2016 are Clean Air Task Force uh, data and reports dealing with elevated cancer risk from oil and gas air pollution and also uh, asthma impacts from the ozone smog that also comes from oil and gas extractions, air pollution. Uh, and so that is the link for the New Mexico specific page, but let me jump over and show you the map really quickly. So uh, I'm hoping 
that folks can see the map right now. Um, we are looking at, uh, in the blue header here, the aggregate statistics for the state of New Mexico. 138,000 people live within the threat radius, 32,009 uh, uh, children and students go to facilities within um, that threat radius. Down at the bottom, um, there are a series of cards that become active once one selects a county. So I'm selecting San Juan County uh, and zooming in. And uh, as long as you see this county uh, visible, you can then click on cards and it will show you data associated with that county. To be clear, you can also go up in the blue bar and click on search and search on street addresses. But uh, if you're just interested in clicking around on counties, this is how you do it. Um, and it will show you the total number of people threatened in the county, and it will show you the demographic breakdowns. Um, all of this information uh, on these cards is also available in spreadsheet form in the media section of the website, as you can see up here in the header. Um, and uh, uh, we also have on the map, all those black dots are oil and gas facilities. If you want to see the threat map or other layers um, that are cluttered by things you're not particularly interested in seeing, you can uncheck layers and uh, those representations will disappear. So because we are interested in schools, I've unchecked everything but uh, school data, and you can click on a uh, school representation and it will tell you the name of the, uh, the school or daycare. Um, you can also do the same with oil and gas facilities. Um, this is data provided by the state, um, it, and it almost always provides the name of the facility. It always provides the API number, the unique identifier for the facility, and the lat long coordinates. With that API number, you can search on it and get uh, the name and the owner of the operate of the uh, facility. Um, so, uh, and you can you can check and uncheck uh, facilities uh, as you desire, as I said. Um, so, with that, I think I will stop there and turn it back over to Alex. Uh, if anybody is interested in a one-on-one -on -one walkthrough of the map and how it works. I am happy uh, to provide that. And so uh, let me turn it back over to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. That is an amazing tool. Um, I really appreciate it. So Janine, we'd love to hear from you now. Hi. Yeah, thank you, Alan. That, that tool is amazing. Um, as mentioned before, my name is Janine Yazi, and I'm from the Diné Nation. I should ask you guys if you hear me first. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm a mother to two beautiful children, um, but I work as an entrepreneur in sustainable development and as a human rights advocate. I, I live in McKinley County with my family, which is adjacent to San Juan County. And um, from Alan's presentation, you can see that this region has some of the highest concentrations of risk from exposure to methane gas and other co pollutants. So in addition to these environmental concerns, uh, my communities have been grappling with the social economic impacts from these industries, namely the crime, influx of drugs, and trafficking of women and children that go hand in hand with the oil and gas fields, uh, with the establishment of man camps, our temporary cluster housing for oil and gas workers. On top of this, my communities and other indigenous peoples in the area and the region have um, their sacred territories and cultural sites um, threatened or are being actively destroyed by oil and natural gas development. So in many ways, we've been at the front lines of understanding all the different layers of impact these industries can have on the health and well-being of our communities and our way of life. 
So when we're faced with threats to eliminate hard-won safeguards, um, as Alan covered in his presentation, um, that help reduce this toxic exposure, the lives of everyone, especially our most vulnerable in our communities and our children will be heavily and immediately impacted. Um, already, there's not enough being done to protect our communities and our environment and our future generations from this type of unnecessary toxic exposure. So we absolutely cannot allow this administration to do even less by not honoring and maintaining the safeguards that were put in place to protect everything that is important to us, as well as our collective well-being. Um, yeah, it remains to, to be reiterated that there's no price high enough to justify the exposure of our most vulnerable to pollutants that will impact their natural development and their quality of life. There's no price high enough to justify the pollution of our land, our air, and our water in ways that affect the survivability of all forms of life for short-term profits. It's incumbent upon us as a state um, to continue to protect these safeguards and to invest in better, smarter ways to meet the energy needs of our people and promote a just and sustainable economy that honors the preciousness of all life. And that's why uh, I do this work. Thank you. Thank you, Janine, very much. Um, so now we'd love to hear from Stacy Stevens. And Stacy, if you could do a quick intro as well. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, nicely said, um, Janine and Alan. Again, my name is Stacy Stevens. I'm an environmental and social justice advocate, and I'm also um, the mother of two beautiful young girls. I've spent quite a bit of time in Northwestern New Mexico, and I've witnessed leaking oil wells firsthand. I've been close enough to smell the toxic fumes from these wells, and I find it shocking that this is happening right next to many of our schools. In fact, I've stood at a well site that is literally a stone's throw away from a playground full of children. As a mother, this just made me cringe. As I mentioned, I have two daughters. Um, both of them have asthma, and it concerns me very much that we are putting children like them at risk. Let's remember, we're talking about children here, some of the most vulnerable populations among us. These kids are often spending eight hours a day at school. These are developing minds and bodies and exposing them to toxic chemicals is unacceptable. Our federal government should be protecting our children, not rolling back safeguards. Oil and gas may have a place in New Mexico, but that place is nowhere near our schools. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stacey. And, um, and thank all of our participants today for your time and in input and your stories. And we definitely have a better understanding of the urgent issues oil and gas pollution brings to New Mexico residents. Um, before we move to our Q&A, if we have some Q&A today, I, I just wanted to make a few points. And um, this is such an incredible tool in visualizing the stories that we're trying to tell and the impact as mothers we're trying to have to move the bar towards protecting our families and our children. Um, methane pollution safeguards would help clean up the air for most of the impacted children living, learning, and playing within this threat radius of a half a mile. It also improved regional and state air quality. Um, as mentioned, in New Mexico, federal methane protections are our only safeguards to protecting the community against toxic air pollution. And now those protections are in jeopardy as this administration is determined to dismantle methane protections and allowing oil and gas industry to leak methane and toxic chemicals into the air without limits, putting our children at greater risk. Knowing that so many children are living, learning, and playing near oil and gas facilities, we need to look to the state of New Mexico to put these safeguards into place. This tool can really help tell these stories and just make people understand what folks in these areas are experiencing. 
Um, so that, that being said, um, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Um, I don't believe we have any chat questions. Any, any other questions out there? Or do either of you, Stacy and Janine, have questions for Alan? Or Alan, do you have questions for Janine and or Stacy? Um, Alan, I just wanted to say once again, like I I'm, was completely blown away by the complexity of the tool and how easy it was to use. Um, and I want to, uh, you know, be able to show your presentation and, and, and the way that you've navigated through the different areas um, to my communities and help with some of our, our land use planning efforts because this is, this is an excellent resource and, and I'm so grateful for it. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We put a lot of time into that. Um, and the reason that we did is because these are not numbers. I mean, they are numbers, but I mean, each one of the people, each one of these students is somebody's child. And um, we really don't want people to forget that. And um, so, Alan, we have one question from Rebecca Moss at the New Mexican. Um, and she's asking, as of what month is the data up to date? Molly is answering that uh, with the 2010 census population data and the 2017 school and hospital data and then well data from 2016 and 17. Is there anything you want to elaborate on with the collection of data or how, how you mine the data? So, and I believe that the, uh, the school enrollment data is from 2015. Um, okay. Molly, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, the census data, the demographic data is from the 2010 census uh, as updated by the Census Bureau, um, I think actually through 2015. I believe it's, it's um, block level data. Um, so I don't, I don't have much um, uh, to elaborate on with that, except to say that in a way it is, we shouldn't have had to make this map. It would be great for people to be able to know as a, as if you're forced to live with oil and gas development, the least it seems that the permitting agencies can do is make it easy for people to know how far they are from these facilities and who owns them uh, in case they, uh, in case there are issues as there often are. Um, and I just like to, for Rebecca and for anybody else that, sees this presentation, just remind people that often the cases with this kind of pollution, operators say, you're imagining things that the, because the pollution is invisible. And that's why the uh, infrared videos are so important because they make clear that there is pollution there, that the smells that you are smelling and the you know the health impacts that you are experiencing is because of something real it's not something you're imagining and the oil and gas industry uh, unfortunately often just claims that you are you're imagining things um alan we, we have yeah. another couple questions from rebecca okay so the number of people impacted is slightly lower than last year so what do you attribute that to? So the, what happened is there are fewer active oil and gas wells because the price of uh, oil and gas went down uh, right. since last year. So that is, uh, it, it's market dynamics. Okay. And then um, do you anticipate the threat increasing with the large investment in the Permian Basin this year? We do, um, and actually, uh, and I invite you, Rebecca, if you're at all interested, 
uh, to ride along on some of these trips. We've been out with the FLIR camera, Molly and uh, our organizer, Sharon, have been out. She's a certified thermographer by the FLIR um, uh, company that makes this $100,000 camera, uh, have been throughout the Permian on the New Mexico side and the Texas side of the border. And the oil and gas industry is just running as if it's not regulated at all. Um, the pollution in the Permian is is horrible, and because of the investment, there's only going to be more of it coming. It's not exactly clean in San Juan, as as folks probably know, but they live with at least a little uh, eye over their shoulder, uh, wondering if anybody's watching. In the Permian, they're confident that nobody is, and the pollution is just much, much worse based on our anecdotal uh, um, experience with the FLIR camera. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? So if there are no more questions, um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for sharing your insights and expertise with us. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for participating. And I want to remind everyone that you'll be able to access a recorded version of the webinar within an hour. Um, we'll email everyone on this call a press release with the link and a few other links that will be helpful to your recording. Um, thank you all so much. You can contact Alan. Alan, do you want to just um, say your, give your sure. email address, please? Sure. Uh, it is uh, A. Septoff, and Septoff is spelled with the first four letters in September, S-E-P-T, and off, like turning off a light switch, O-F-F, -F, at earthworksaction.org. And or you can contact me, A. Merlino, M-E-R-L-I-N-O, at momscleanairforce.org reach out to either one of us for any follow-up. And thank you all. Thank you, Alex. And thanks. thanks everybody else. All right. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.